afternoon. Good afternoon, Brian. How are you? Congratulations on another uh, year of classes being completed. <laughs> Uh, I notice that uh, it's a landmark in several ways. I think um, I think we're further into what I like to call the crucial phase of globalization, which I think is illustrated uh, in the last few days by the total inability of the United Nations to achieve anything in Syria. I, I would agree with that. And, and look at the, the primary promoter of trying to get the UN to act as a former Secretary General, Kofi Annan. Yes. Is who, if anybody knows how to do it, he should know how to do it. One would think. Uh, but it's, it's amazing. I think that there's um, generally a very poor understanding about what the United Nations is trying to do and is capable of doing and uh, could be doing. Mm -hmm. After all, the United Nations costs an enormous amount of money. If it isn't able to do anything that we want it to do, then we need to answer these questions. But I don't see very much effort in the media to try to answer these questions, and the people I talk to don't seem to have much idea of what the answers should be. Well, it's, it's interesting if you look at uh, one of the premises of the UN, everybody always thinks of, of global peace and, and greater harmony. But I think it's very clear that, at least since Libya, uh, what it's clear, one of the other corollary reasons is to, as much as possible, prevent unilateral actions. So, I mean, now we have the French, uh, of course, it was probably vitriol, which came out of the presidential election, advocating the use of military force in Syria. Of course, they have former colonial influence there. Uh, but nevertheless, for them to begin to say that, to either put the pressure on the Security Council or at least to indicate that somebody is thinking of acting unilaterally, I mean, why, why not someone act unilaterally? Why, why not do what, what's been done in the past? Why not have the great powers act as a subset and intervene? I mean, they're not going to do that because of the ramifications in this case. Well, the problem is legitimacy. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, uh, and even um, a previous president of, of uh, the United States seemed to be uh, concerned to get legitimacy, international legitimacy for foreign activities if he could. Um, but if you think about it, uh, the, I think the United Nations served, everybody understood what it was doing between 1945 and 1991 when it served as a place where Americans and, and uh, uh, others in the West uh, and Soviets and others in the Soviet bloc uh, could talk to each other on neutral ground. Mm -hmm. um, and that, to some extent, did provide some containment for um, unexpected hostilities and difficulties. Mm -hmm. well, when, when you think back to in 1950, when the North Koreans invaded South Korea, but for the fact that the Soviets, who uh, then occupied the Russian seat, were boycotting the UN, uh, there would never have been a, a, a UN uh, coalition to fight against the North Koreans. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, I, there's, there's a lot that has to, in the UN, record from 45 to 91 that has to do with that relationship, mm -hmm. I think, in one way or another. But since 1991, uh, the record is much less clear. Um, and certainly what the UN is doing is that it's um, providing a means for an enormous amount of meeting and discussion in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that's extremely valuable. But um, if you've ever been to a United Nations conference, uh, you may uh, want to ask the question, so what? What actually does all this meeting and discussion amount to? And I think that the importance is not what gets said publicly and recorded, but what get, goes on behind the scenes at these meetings, because they, the meetings do provide a, um, uh, a mechanism for people who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity to meet to get together and talk. And that we can't, we can never really quantify that or know exactly what happens, but I think it is valuable. But if you then go back to 1945 again and look at other things that have happened internationally, um, that is, that uh, appear to be helping us to transcend the division of the world up into these little parcels called nation states. Mm -hmm. Um, there's been a gradual growth of, um, of international organizations, mainly, mainly regional organizations. And to begin with, they were all organizations, I think, of military alliance in the Middle East and Southeast Asia, um, 
were the two main ones that come to my mind. Well, NATO was the first, of course. NATO, CEDO, CENTO. Yeah, they were those, all those three. Um, I can't remember now whether there was a Latin American one or not. I don't think that came until later. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, more recently, the emphasis has been much more on um, uh, regional organizations for economic mm -hmm. collaboration and discussion. Um, and they have, to some extent, facilitated the relaxation of, of tariffs, but not very much more, I don't think. And, of course, there's been the embarrassment of the relationship between Burma and the other Southeast Asian states in that particular organization. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, the, but globally, beyond the regional level, beyond the level of states that are almost uh, touching each other's borders, there's been very little growth of any sort of formal structure. And um, what I would suggest is that um, what's been happening since the middle of the last century in every sphere of, um, of activity has been the gradual relaxation of structural um, provision for interaction. So um, it's not surprising that things that are structured are not working anymore and things that are working are due to initiative and um, uh, decision to actually go out and try and do something and see if it works. So do, does that mean that the, the machinery has become passe? I mean, it's almost as if, uh, for example, the, the, the Congress of Vienna machinery was still rudimentarily, rudimentar rudimentarily in place leading up to World War I, but it was obviously uh, superseded by the events that, that created World War I. I mean, are you saying that the UN now simply can't keep up with the way things are changed? I think that the, what I'm, what I'm uh, suggesting is that the, the establishment of the United Nations in 1945, uh, according to the structure that essentially still exists, because it's, it's been very little change to it since then, Mm -hmm. uh, happened at the end of a period of history in which everything was achieved by more and by developing more and more refined structures, more and more complex structures. And uh, since about the, not very long after that, the middle of the century, in the 50s and 60s, um, gradually those structures have ceased to be as effective as they were before. And more and more of what actually happens, happens in spite of the structures. Um, and I think that that's generally uh, what is happening in the phase of globalization that began in the middle of the last century. Um, so I, I don't want to say when globalization started, because I think you can say that it started um, at any time you want to say that it started. And I would say it started with the... Um, peopling of the world by our species, but, mm -hmm. um, but we're in a particular phase of it now which, have made, which has made us conscious of it and, and led us to develop the term for it, so we now call it globalization, which we didn't think of before. Uh, but, but everything that's happening now is less predictable, and as you know yourself from the insurance injury, in, industry, um, uh, if it's less predictable, then, then according to the way we used to think about risk, there's more risk. Mm -hmm. um, well, you're, you're right, and exactly, it's exactly the case that this understanding is known down even to the, uh, the lowest level, uh, if you will, of a person on the street in, in, uh, in Hama in uh, Syria, right, who knows full well that the United Nations is not going to act mm -hmm. because they can't act. But yet knows also full well that there's a certain measure of atrocity, of pain, that the West will only accept, and that at some point, either France or the United States or the United Kingdom or Italy are, are going to intervene and do something. And I think that's inevitable. I mean, if let's let's say that today 69 people were killed, for example, in an explosion, they're finger pointing as to whose fault it was. But let's say it was 690 people, and let's say tomorrow was another 690 people. I mean, by the middle of next week, action would come, UN or not. You can, I bet on that, I would suspect. But the, in every case, it's going to be done by leaders that depend upon popular election. That's correct. And it, it just happens to be a year when there are several of those elections. Mm -hmm. 
And so what actually happens next week or sometime uh, before too long is going to be uh, a product of the growth of awareness in the, in the electorate in various countries that is going to give leaders the confidence to go ahead and do something which they think will um, uh, be seen as legitimate, even though there's no longer any formal legitimacy for what they do outside their own borders. Well, that brings back to an interesting point, all right? If, if you think back to the, the EU, all right, back with the, uh, the Treaty of Maastricht, um, the, the Dutch town, I think back in the late 80s, mm -hmm. when they finally put together the, the European Financial Union and finally put the icing on the cake on the, the, the monetary plan. For Margaret the, Thatcher's last big public performance. That, that's correct. I mean, I think now, in retrospect, seeing the, the financial uh, tangle that has intertwined the whole continent, I think that they knew back then, and they looked at each other and they said, well, okay, we're pushing this down the road, but this will irrevocably guarantee that we're going to stay together as a unit because we'll have no choice but for the richer countries to bail the poorer countries out because we're going to be so tightly tied in. And I think what they overlooked, and who could have predicted it, is what's happened in Spain with the new Spanish government, what's certainly going to happen in France, uh, either with the new president or Sarkozy coming over to the left if he wins, what's probably going to happen in the Netherlands. I mean, these people are going to be thrown out and the voice of the people is going to be heard saying, no more austerity, enough, this isn't our problem. We didn't get rich in 2008. We're not going to pay the brunt of this. But, uh, and, and I agree with you, and I've got, I think I can add another variable into this mixture, which is the relationship between global finance and euro finance, uh, which is what, uh, part of, partly what kept England out of the, or should I say the United Kingdom, out of the euro Boy, is that looking like a good decision now or what? Experiment to begin yeah. with. And uh, is uh, the reason why uh, Cameron is not working together with Merkel and Sarkozy on the euro problem now. He, I mean, he's, he's I think, uh, being as collegial as he can be, but he couldn't go along with some of the things that they were suggesting. Um, but I think that the, the, um, the, the way nation states are functioning, um, has changed in relation to what goes on beyond nation states, and we haven't got used to it yet. So that, mm -hmm. that the amount of financial activity in London, which continues to grow despite everything else, has to be somehow related to a national economy and to economies on other levels. And um, I don't think that either economists or politicians have come to terms with that yet. You're, you're, you're quite correct. And in fact, even though London, uh, the UK, stands apart, if you will, from, from, the, uh, from the, the common currency, any regulations, any law that the parliament passes, a regulation that the uh, executive branch passes, has to uh, be, uh, I, I don't know if approved, but they have to be uh, in, in accordance with what Brussels is coming out with. And it also works in reverse. If the EU in Brussels begins to give out directives, for example, on uh, uh, common standards relating to automobile manufacturing or fiberglass for uh, housing siding, for example, those regulations are picked up and used by, by fiat in the UK. And one thing struck me today, there was a, there's an argument that was going on yesterday in front of the Supreme Court of the United States on the Arizona immigration law, which the administration, the Obama administration is saying is unconstitutional. And Antonin Scalia, when he was uh, in the courtroom, um, commenting on the Solicitor General's argument, saying that, in fact, if, if this law in Arizona is upheld, it may have foreign policy implications with Mexico. Scalia's retort was, so what? We have to make our laws now in consideration of Mexican laws? And it's like, excuse me, Mr. Scalia, <laughs> if you were in Europe, yes, you would have to do just that. And it's amazing how far behind the legal profession is in taking account of the international situation that is becoming more and more important for how citizens, how governments deal with their own citizens. It's like they're living in a bubble. It's amazing. 
but it but this is all it's the structure of the that that gradually grew up until the middle of the last century which is still inhibiting development since then uh, because the development has outgrown the structures but hasn't got rid of them yet mm -hmm. and that's I think true in law it's true in fight in uh, Finance. It's true finance. Like finance is structured, and of course, politics. There's, there is no international structure for politics at all, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is one of the major problems we have, and there probably never will be. But, but what I think is uh, developing in its place is um, uh, more and more uh, interaction that's international that makes sure that leads to a global situation in which people are much better informed and can work together and somehow produce uh, a moving equilibrium. But that's well, an optimist's point of view. Well, let me ask you, to, in, in, as we wrap up, um, these, these little uh, videos are posted on the internet. Let's say a citizen in Syria who is concerned about the future happens to watch one. What do you think is going to happen, given the, uh, uh, the age and the creakiness of the international structures? How is it going to be responded to, if at all? Sooner or later, uh, one or more leaders in one of the o in the OECD countries are going to feel that they have enough popular support to do something. But what they actually decide to do is going to depend on what happens in Syria between now and then. Okay. Well, let's watch and keep our eyes on that. Maybe that will be the focus of another chat. <laughs> See you next week. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> okay. All right.